Welcome to Aaron Menke's Cabinet of Curiosities, a production of iHeartRadio and Grim and Mild. Our world is full of the unexplainable. And if history is an open book, all of these amazing tales are right there on display, just waiting for us to explore. Welcome to the Cabinet of Curiosities. Declaring war on the United States is no small action. It means intending to fight the most powerful military force in the world. In 1989, the U.S. invaded Panama after President Bush Sr. mistook the country's declaration as a serious threat. The situation lasted just over a month, but by the end, the invasion had killed between 300 and 1,000 Panamanians and destroyed tens of thousands of homes. Looking back on the devastation, it's clear to see why so few have tried to go up against America. Well, one nation learned that lesson the hard way when it seceded and then swiftly declared war on an enemy it was grossly underpowered to face. It was called the Conch Republic, and it was formed in 1982. The small island had been known as Cayo Hueso, a U.S. territory, and boasted a population of 24,000 people from all over the world. Germans, Cubans, and Irish travelers, among others, had settled on the island over the years, turning it into quite the melting pot. The United States had set up a military checkpoint on the island that year, inspecting cars for drugs and signs of human trafficking operations. Those on the island were not pleased by the interference to their day-to-day lives, nor were the tourists who flocked there to kick back and relax. The checkpoints caused massive traffic jams as long as 17 miles. People getting around the island couldn't do so easily without having their vehicles stopped and searched. As a result of the intrusion, many would-be visitors chose instead to go to nearby locations not under U.S. occupation. They canceled their reservations, opting instead for vacations where they could travel without harassment. The city council tried to get the checkpoints removed by filing an injunction against the U.S. government in federal court, but the case was dismissed. There was a drug problem in the United States, and it was believed that the key to ending it lied in verifying the contents of each car passing through Cayo Hueso. Well, the island's mayor, Dennis Wardlow, couldn't take it anymore. A certain word kept cropping up in meetings between the mayor and his advisors, and one day it seemed like it might be the best way forward. That word? Secession. If the United States was going to treat the island like a foreign country, then it would have to behave like one too. So on April 23rd of 1982, the time had come for Cayo Hueso to separate from the United States. It was officially renamed to the Conch Republic, named for the slang term used to describe the many Bahamians living on the island who had come from European descent. Mayor Wardlow had suddenly become the prime minister, and among his first actions as the head of a new nation, he declared war on America. However, he did it in the most unusual way, by cracking a loaf of Cuban bread over the head of someone wearing a U.S. Navy uniform. It didn't take long for Wardlow to realize he was in over his head, though, and surrendered one minute after declaring independence of the Conch Republic. He then asked the United States for a billion dollars in foreign aid. So why isn't the Conch Republic found on any maps? Because its original name, Cayo Hueso, is Spanish for Key West, the island that's technically part of Florida. The secession wasn't real. It had been nothing more than a noisy publicity stunt to send a message to the U.S. government about its obtrusive checkpoints. And they listened. Shortly after the Conch Republic rejoined America, the checkpoints were shut down and tourism to the island boomed. But peace was never permanent. For example, in 1995, when the U.S. Army Reserve sent a battalion to Key West for a training exercise, Conch officials were never alerted. In response, Mayor Wardlow ordered a schooner to pelt a Coast Guard vessel with stale Cuban bread and water balloons. The act of aggression was met with equal force by the U.S. Coast Guard, who turned their fire hoses on the attacking ship, bringing the fight to an abrupt end. The city of Key West contacted the Department of Defense and complained about their lack of notice about the exercise. The Department of Defense sent an apology and accepted the Conch Republic's so-called surrender a few days later. Today, the Conch Republic is still going strong. It has its own navy, advertised as the largest sail-propelled navy in the world, and it hosts several events in April as part of its Independence Day celebration. It just goes to show that making a big public protest about something can often get results. 
And sometimes all it takes is a declaration of war on the United States. Explosive holiday celebrations are more common than you think. Almost everyone is familiar with American Independence Day, when towns all over the country light up the night sky with elaborate firework displays. It's held on July 4th, the day the Founding Fathers signed the Declaration of Independence and officially severed ties with England. The tradition dates all the way back to the first anniversary of the signing in 1777, when Philadelphia, Pennsylvania became host to a full-blown festival. It included the ringing of bells, a parade, and the launch of 13 rockets into the air. But July 4th isn't the only holiday where things explode. There's also the Beltane Fire Festival in Scotland. Every April 30th, the Beltane Fire Society of Edinburgh lights torches and a huge bonfire to ring in the beginning of summer. Some who join in the festivities shed their clothes and dance among the flames as music plays into the night. And who could forget Burning Man, the week-long community event held at the end of August each year in Nevada. On the Saturday night before Labor Day, an 85-foot-tall wooden effigy is burned in the middle of the desert as attendees gather around, dancing and cheering. Meanwhile, the small town of San Juan de la Vega, Mexico, has its own celebration. And it's not only a lot of fun, it's also incredibly dangerous. The thing about a tradition as old as this one is that its origin isn't definitive. According to one account, the festival got its start in the 17th century when a man known as San Juanito decided to go up against the local landowners, who were taking money out of the hands of the hard-working townsfolk. San Juanito began stealing back from them, earning him the nickname of Mexico's Robin Hood. Unfortunately, his efforts also resulted in retribution from those landlords. A fight ensued, and one side resorted to using hammers fitted with small bombs that detonated on impact. Another story claimed that Juan de la Vega, the man for whom the town was named, had his gold stolen by bandits. St. John the Baptist helped him get it back, and the town's residents celebrated by tying explosives to large hammers and setting them off. Whatever the case, the victory is honored today with a festival every February known in Spanish as Fiesta de los Martillos Explosivos. In English, it's called the Festival of Exploding Hammers. San Juan de la Vega, located about 160 miles north of Mexico City, is quiet for most of the year, with very little going on to elicit concern. People go about their daily lives without incident until that one day in February when they pull out their sledgehammers and gunpowder and let loose. Modern-day revelers don't use anything as volatile as dynamite or C4. Instead, they fasten a mixture made of potassium chlorate and sulfur to the end of their sledgehammers. The hammers are then hoisted and slammed onto a steel beam in the middle of a rocky field. What follows is a giant cloud of smoke and a blast with a force so strong it's enough to send someone flying back several feet. It is so popular, thousands come to witness the event with over a hundred first responders standing by in case things go wrong. Which they do. A lot. In 2020, 43 people required medical attention, including one person who was carried out on a stretcher after he hurt his leg in the blast. And the people wielding the hammers aren't the only ones who suffer injuries, either. Spectators in the line of fire are often hit by shrapnel caused by the blasts. It's clear that the Festival of Exploding Hammers is one of the most unique cultural traditions recognized today. And if you decide to go and see it for yourself, maybe wear some protective goggles just in case. I hope you've enjoyed today's guided tour of the Cabinet of Curiosities. Subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts or learn more about the show by visiting curiositiespodcast.com. This show was created by me, Aaron Mankey, in partnership with How Stuff Works. I make another award-winning show called Lore, which is a podcast, book series, and television show And you can learn all about it over at theworldoflore.com. And until next time, stay curious.